Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of RSA 2024. We're, we're deep into day two, and really excited to have Art Gilliland, he's the Chief Executive Officer, and Phil Calvin, the Chief Product Officer at Delenia. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very Thanks much, good, uh, good to be here, thank, thank you. you. Let's start off with your business, you guys are identity specialists. Uh, tell us where you fit in the marketplace. Yeah, so if you think about identity, there's sort of three big sort of categories. Authentication, I am art, I can prove it. Uh, yeah. Authorization, what should art be allowed to do? And governance, or identity governance, and like tell me everything that art has access to or the things he's touched over the last six months and sort of the reporting side of that. We are definitely square in the authorization space and so we help to think about privilege and privilege management, so PAM is a big part of that product. Um, and then we just made a recent acquisition of a company called FastPath which takes us into the identity governance space. So I want to ask you, so there's been efforts to sort of bring PAM and, and IAM together, but then that hasn't really taken hold. Yeah. Why is that? Why, what's special about, about PAM? How do you see the threats evolving in identity? Maybe you could sort of connect those dots for our audience. Yeah, I think if you think about authentication, so the IAM, identity access management part of that, there's a, a big part of that that's just infrastructure. So like, I need access to this thing and I need an account and here's your, here's your account and that's the, the sort of infrastructure part of it. PAM really focuses much more on the security problem, like what should you be allowed to do? How do I make sure that that's the right policy, being able to set those policies for your super users? And you don't want those users to actually have access to those passwords. You want to control them centrally, you want to manage them centrally, you want to report and audit and compliance, and so that's a lot more of a security use case. And I think that's why you haven't seen, a, you, you hear a lot about convergence, but you don't see that convergence there really. So how do you see the threats in your space evolving? And then I really want to get into the, to the product and the platform. Yeah, so I mean look, I think the, what's happening in the marketplace is you see this massive move of customers to the cloud, like SaaS applications is a big way. If you look at our company, we almost entire infrastructure of our company is run in SaaS, whether it's the, the quote to cash process or the dev process, it's all in SaaS which means a lot of your uh, accounts are up there, it means all the interconnectedness that's happening in SaaS, and what that's done for customers, huge explosion in the number of identities they need to manage. Not just their human identities, the workforce and consultants that work in there, but also all these machine identities, so all the APIs that connect to each other and all these applications that are talking in the cloud. And so customers are having to deal with that, uh, and they don't actually know where they all are, they don't have ways of controlling or managing them, they're like, being able to find them and like manage them is a, is a big risk for them. And so what's happening is the adversary is going after that confusion, after that all that interconnectedness and stealing passwords or stealing credentials. And so they don't have to break into your environment anymore, they just log in. And so real focus on that identity and identity security has been a huge, probably one of the top three uh, issues for CISOs over the last five years. Yeah, absolutely. It's just the, the hackers are capitalizing on the chaos. So Phil, from an, from an architectural standpoint, how do you think about building products, or maybe, is it a, should I think of it as a platform? Um, platform or product, let's start there, and then how do you think about architecting that? So, uh, so I'm, I'm a techie, so I'm going to say platform, and, and basically the way we've approached it is, we, we had the originally these two companies, Psychotic and, and Centrify, and we re-architected to build a cloud-native platform, and that's a bunch of technical gobbledygook, but what that gets you is a 99, 0.9% uptime, you get the continuous push code to production. We are able to innovate extremely quickly um, with our customers and solve their use cases really quickly on the platform. So the platform, the control point is, is, is the cloud, cloud right. native, yeah. and then I can run that anywhere, is that correct? Well, we, we run the platform, we run it as yeah, a, yeah, as right, a SaaS service and we can geographically run it, run it anywhere. Um, and in addition to the, the platform itself, what we do is we bring all the use cases and capabilities onto the platform in an experience that is, that is extremely easy to use, really quick to adopt, very, we're very focused on the user experience and the admin total cost, it gives our platform a distinct advantage. So, how are customers dealing with all this, this chaos? Like what's, what's the sort of current state, what's the ideal state you're trying to get them to? Yeah, I mean look, I think the, the current state is that they're, they're flailing. <laughs> I mean you can't look at the news and, and, yeah. and think oh, they've got their hands around this idea anything, they've got they their don't. hands around the, the security standpoint. And, and to be fair, the security industry is not helping them. We throw 
100,000 different acronyms at, at our customers and that, that creates a challenge. And so I think where we want to get them to is we want to move them to platforms that solve a problem, not, not a bunch of different small products, not a bunch of different industries. We actually want to be able to sort of solve that problem over time. And so what Delinea is very focused on right now is how do I help you manage what your users should have access to, whether that user is a human or a machine, and can we set policies that make sense for what art should be allowed to do, or what this API should be allowed to do, and who it should connect to, and I think that is what we want to help customers get to, especially in a world where you don't own your infrastructure anymore. So, the user and their interactions with data is going to be key, and being able to set policy and manage that is going to be the future that we want to try to get customers and, to. And, and the name Delinea is because you delineate who has access to what, right? Exactly I mean, right, yeah. exactly right. That's where the name came from. We went through a whole process of renaming, and that's, uh, we, that made the most sense for our customers, really helping them delineate between what you should be allowed to do and what you shouldn't be. So there, I want to talk customer strategies, CISO strategies. There's a lot of talk about, especially from some of the big guys, about consolidating, you certainly hear that, lot from the likes of Palo Alto. Yep. But the reality is, is customers are actually increasing the number of, of tools uh, for a variety of reasons we can talk about, but yep. are, do you, are you able to help customers just sort of simplify their environment or, or is it really about just hardening the sort of privileged access? So look, I think, I think what we want to try to do is help customers solve a problem across a whole bunch of different areas. Mm -hmm. And so what Delinea is focused on is that authorization space. And so that authorization could happen on your laptop or computer and the user's interaction with the applications there could happen in your interaction with SaaS, could happen with your contractors trying to get access to sensitive systems in your environment. And so it's really about setting policy around authorization. In the past, you would have bought one product for that, another product for contractors, another product here, and what we're saying is it's actually trying to simplify the problem space around uh, a category of problems around authorization for us. Um, I think you look at other companies like Palo Alto, they are talking about the network connections and those connections, or Zscaler with network connections, or uh, CrowdStrike at Endpoint. We're saying identity is the a heart of what security is going to look like in the future, and so that's why we're focused there. So Phil, what are you seeing as the big tech trends that are, that are affecting security, uh, uh, enterprise IT? Love to get your thoughts on, on AI and Gen AI, where that fits in your world. So I think the, the, the massive shift we're going is this, this transformation to the cloud. Every, or every organization is doing it. Art mentioned about our infrastructure, but every organization is doing that transformation. And that just brings a, your security focus goes away from managing bits and bytes and managing networks and all that kind of stuff. The perimeter is no longer the perimeter of your, of your, of your VPN or your environment. The perimeter is what you're authorized to do. And so we think that's the central, the central point of it. The trends that we're definitely seeing, we've got some very interesting investigations into AI. One in particular I'll talk briefly about is we have the ability inside PAM to record the session that the user's actually done. And so you could imagine thousands of hours of recordings. We can actually apply an AI model to those sessions and get the anomalies detected down to maybe 10 hours. So it's massive savings for, for an, an administrator that is trying to find out something that goes on because we've given them that information AI. It's very targeted use. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, and that's the type of innovation that I think we want to continue trying to do. So how does that work? You're sort of observing yeah, behavior? So, yeah, so dro dropping and into the technology a little bit. So we record a video session, um, and we use uh, OCR to return that, that recorded video session into a story, and then we apply an LLM to that story, and we look for anomalies. So Phil normally logs into the server, just does his normal, normal uh, behavior, that's okay. He went in there once and he changed a DNS entry. That gets flagged by the, uh, by the AI, and all of a sudden the admin has a, instead of a thousand hours of sessions, they have maybe an hour or two hours that they can look at to find anomalous behavior. And, and this, is, this is the use case for Gen AI, LLM yeah. specifically. Correct. Uh, um, how are you, like what are you using? Are you sort of, it's all over the place, right? And Rama <laughs> 3 comes out and you're like, wow, that looks really interesting, and it's open source, and it's actually just as good as GPT, and you know, and it's the 770 billion, and there's smaller models, and so how do you sort through all that uh, I mean, ping-ponging? Well, first of all, we have some very, very smart technology people um, uh, that, are, that are really plugged into what's doing, but I think that when you're building software, you have to be extremely deliberate about how you approach it. You can't react to the latest technology trend. You have to be focused on what are you using this, this particular thing. In our case, in the LLM that we're using, um, we're very focused on how we're training that model, which is really where the, where the interesting thing comes out, uh, and then you build good software around it. it, it, it building software is not about a technical buzzword, it's about the execution and diligence when you're doing it, and really enabled by the, the cloud-native investment that we talked about. And it, it, because your data set 
is, is very confined um, and constrained, I presume that largely eliminates or maybe completely eliminates the sort of problems that everybody has with LLMs, which is hallucinations and correct. pulling stuff off the internet and making stuff up. Yeah, correct. Um, our, our use of AI is isolated to what our customers are actually using, the sessions recording. It's not a general purpose AI model that, that is you know, taking data from the public internet. We work on the, there's two parts, there's the training of the model and the execution of the model. And, and the, the, that stuff happens in isolation with our customers' data. We're not commingling our customers' data with the public internet, or as an example. Are you actually doing heavy duty training, or would you call it more fine tuning? Uh, the start was a lot of heavy duty training, really? and now we're, right now we're into the refinement of the modeling and making sure. So you had to get, get access to GPUs, presumably in the cloud, yeah. or yeah. But did you use the public cloud or some alternative so th cloud? Th this is a little bit of an interesting story about our innovation. So we, uh, we again, I talked about the cloud native. We do hackathons with my engineering team, right. and so this idea came up, um, and they started working on it using just general open source models, uh, and we went from concept to something in production in about four or five weeks. Um, that's just the rate of innovation that we're, we're able to pull off. Um, and it's evolved since then and now it's starting to turn into a, a real product. I mean, open source has been amazing. I mean, you think about, yep. you think about the impact that Linux had on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, it took a long time to emerge and the LAMP stack. It actually kind of neutralized Microsoft's dominance. A lot of people don't yeah. maybe remember that. The impact of, of open source in AI and, and LLMs is just amazing. I mean, you're talking about like a year after GPT-4, Llama 3 comes out. I mean, the time is so compressed. Yeah. Having said that, so that's really, that's the one positive. Having said that, are there concerns that you have as a technology practitioner about open source, some of the fine print license? I've talked to some customers, they were, you know, even though we're not the size of ByteDance, you know, or yeah. Meta, we're a little bit worried that they could pull the rug out from underneath us. How, how do you think about that and address I'll, that? I'll give you my perspective and then maybe Art can yeah. give you his. I mean, from our, from our perspective, we have a very diligent process by which we integrate open, any open source, whether it's whatever it happens to be, into our process, and that has to go through a formal process that myself and our legal team and our, our security team and all that kind of stuff. So we have a formal process around that in terms of how I think about it, and I don't know if you want to talk about how yeah, you I think mean, about the business. Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective on the business side, obviously it's about governance and security and who owns the data and where we do that. So before we launch a feature that is supported by some of this open source, we do a lot of diligence to make sure like, what's happening with our customer data, and our, we're super diligent about that, because obviously if you're putting your things in the cloud, we need to protect that and we take that super seriously. It's probably our number one priority if you look at the security priority list, is protecting our customer's data. And so making sure we have the legal frameworks for it, making sure we've invested heavily in our own in, like, investigation of where the data goes, how it gets trained, which is why we, it's okay to practice in the public internet and do pilots and POCs there, but when you are going to build and run the thing yourself, you actually want that control, you want, to, you want to be able to train the models yourself. One, because it's more efficient, more cost effective for the company, but also because it, it provides a lot more security and protection for their customer's data. What is this fundamental salient, maybe there's not one, but maybe, I'm sure there's many, there's a platform, that, that enables your technology to be you know, world class, we talk about the differentiators, but, but what's that secret sauce? Uh, so I, I'll say it's not secret sauce, it's diligence and execution. Um, I mean, building software, if you do it right, takes investment, and I, I always use the terms of like uh, doing your exercise and eating your vegetables. Like the, the building, the heavy lifting to do all of the automation and the scale and all that testing, that takes work, it's not secret sauce, it can't be done overnight and you can't pretend to do it, so if you have an old architecture and you just lift it and throw it in the cloud, you know, you're going to have things like, you need to update your software, it's going to take you half an hour and you're going to take it down. You, you, you do the investment properly, you do your diligence, then you, uh, you get what we have, which you can push software continuously and your customers can see continuous uptime. So. Yeah, and just to add to that, I, mean, I think one of the challenges that you'll see in the space is, if you were in a, a big, well-established company, you've got a lot of customers sitting on legacy infrastructure, and so just switching your, snapping your fingers and switching them over is hard, and so a lot of customers, when they wanted to get to the, or companies, when they wanted to get to the cloud fast, they basically took their on-premise thing and did some Kubernetes things and put stuff in containers and then put it yeah. in the cloud and said, oh, that's cloud native. That is not what we did. We literally started over and like for 18 months, we essentially rebuilt the guts of our product after the acquisition, and so you take a sideways step in terms of your innovation on your legacy products, but what it buys you in the future is being able to do four and a half nines of uh, availability for your customers. You can deploy code in 30 minutes from the time the engineer finishes through all the QA and everything, because everything's built around automation. And your competitors just cannot do that. So unless you take that energy and really diligently re-architect, you cannot be cloud native, uh, just because you put some stuff in Kubernetes. 
You're absolutely right. People put a, you know, wrap their, took a wrap around <laughs> their existing stack, shoved yeah. it into the cloud, say, hey, we're cloud two. Exactly. And yeah. then they paid all the, the, the penalty, and then eventually they tried to you know, get there, but they lost yeah. ground to some of their competitors. But, but, so the secret sauce really is, like I say, hard work, you know, understanding how to build platforms. Cloud yeah. native is part of that. It's not like, oh, we, got, we invented something that's radical, we just did the work. Well, I really also th I think there's a, there's a part of it. You have to be as aligned as a company. Like, like, to go take that 18 months for, for mm -hmm. myself and my team and my engineers to build this, that means that art needed to be aligned to that as a strategy and, yeah. and recognize that this is building a long-term, uh, we use the term future-proof solution, but that has to be something, can't be just a technology decision, that's a business decision that art, art and, our, and, our, and our board needs to be aligned behind and, and that, yeah. that allows us to, to be successful. But, but how do we get there? I mean, I think the big thing is why would you make that decision? It starts with our customers. Like you ask the customers what is it they need and when you start talking about SaaS, they want, okay, make sure it's up all the time. What kind of security infrastructure you have. Features and functions will get developed over time. Like, yes, a deal here or there hinges on a feature, but there's like core elements of things you have to deliver and if, you, if customers are going to really take advantage of the cloud and the availability of the cloud and the flexibility and the scalability of the cloud, you have to do some things right and I think that was the big driver of it. It starts with talking to your customer and really listening to what your customer needs. So let's talk about the customer. What yeah. you're seeing there, maybe we can take some examples. I'm mean, always interested in the business case, you know, how you sort of justify this, what kind of returns people are seeing. What can you tell me? Yeah, I mean, I, so, uh, in terms of PAM, so part, part yeah. of why, we'll start with PAM and then we'll talk about SaaS, because I think those are, the, they're, those are the two sort of ROI choices that people try to make. The first one is around, really around uh, insurance, cost savings, uh, and I, I think un unfortunately that's just true in the security space. You're, you're sort of buying these tools and putting them in place to lower your risk posture, and those, that risk posture helps you sell more potentially to your customers because they trust you more, uh, avoids the downside of a breach and, and all the costs associated with that. In particular in PAM, it's required for cyber insurance, and so uh, you can actually cut your cyber insurance costs in half by having effectively deployed PAM in your environment, and so a lot of those things we talk about with customers and helping them build their business case internally. The second business case we help them do is that move from on-premise running this yourself to SaaS. Um, and the reality is, is we are investing heavily in, in our SaaS infrastructure and our cloud operations team and availability because it's our profit center. And so very few if no customers can invest in the same way to the same level of diligence to keep their product up and running, to keep the system patched and all of that availability that they would get from the cloud. And so, that is about uptime, it's about availability, it's about usability, it's about uh, taking advantage of innovation that they just can't do, and so there are some what I would call soft benefits that they, uh, that they also build into a business case in particular when they move to cloud, as well as the hard costs of they don't have to own it, they don't have to upgrade it, they don't have to patch it, all this cost savings that would go into that for them uh, on a human cost basis. Okay, but it really is, I mean, you're right, it's about the reduction in expected loss. Are, yep. you, are you able to, even if it's anecdotal from your customers, get feedback that that's actually happening in the field. Well, there's, I mean, there's a real tangible dollar cost right now when you do it, because when you buy and put PAM in, you get a discount on your cyber insurance. And so that's real dollars. Yes, it's still assigned, it's still connected to risk, because that's how your, your terms get built in a, an insurance world, but that's real money that comes back into the pocket of a, of a company today, and so we see as much as 50%, uh, sometimes more, on the cost savings of their, for cyber insurance, just from PAM. Uh, really? And so there's big cost savings. So it's not like um, when I install the alarm, I mean, the, the no, you get a, you get a 5% <laughs> discount, yeah, yeah. no. It's, like, it's not yeah. 5%. It's not even we're, worth we're it. Talking, right. We're talking big savings because if you look at the reasons, the, like the big challenge for customers with breaches, every single breach that ha occurs is an identity-based breach, almost every single one, like in the yeah. high 90s. And so being more secure, really working with two-factor authentication, really working on sort of privilege management, allows you to control the blast radius for these breaches. You may still get in, but they can't elevate privileges. They can't move around the organization as easily. And so the cost of breaches radically comes down for customers, which is why insurance gives such a big discount. That's interesting. I was, um, last, last Saturday, the Berkshire Hathaway yep. uh, annual meeting was on, which really interrupted my handicapping for the <laughs> Kentucky Derby, <laughs> which is why I lost. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've lost my lip. Anyway, um, and Ajit Jain, who runs their insurance yep. you know, business, was, he got a question on, on cyber insurance, and he basically, his answer was very negative, like, 
we hate this business, we assume we're going to lose money, um, and we, but we got to do it, you know, it's obviously a hot area. And it's very hard you know, to underwrite. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and then we had, we had a company called AppBay on earlier this mm -hmm. week, and they basically combine cyber insurance and they have a managed service as well, but, and they basically saying what you're saying, we can dramatically lower the risk profile if, they, if the customer does these things, and obviously Pam you know, is, a, is, is one of the harder things to do. Yeah. Um, and by 50% savings, that's, that's substantial. Yeah, it's, it's big savings. I know that was true for our, our uh, renewal and I know it's true for a lot of our customers renewals. Um, how's the conference going? I mean, there's like crazy. This is like back to pre-COVID levels, right? A lot of yeah. noise, What's, where's the signal? How do yeah. you guys differentiate from all this noise? Yeah, I mean look, I think the reality is, is there's a bunch of learning that happens in the conference just by going to see the vendors, but a lot of it is the interaction with the customers and the interactions we can have with our partners. I mean, you come to RSA, yes, there's some learning that happens on the floor, but the real value of it is you can do like six or eight months worth of meetings in like five days. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, you, you sort of wear yourself out, but that's, you know, people are excited about identity security, it's one of the top three um, sort of priorities for CISOs, and so the number of meetings, the number of interactions you can have with customers and partners at a show like this is just extraordinary, which is why we invest in it. Yeah. Last word. Uh, last word, I mean, it's, to me it's an exciting show. I love to see some of the innovation. As a product guy, I like to look and see what the small companies are doing, just to see where they're thinking. Um, that's, that's always really interesting to me, and you know, I spend a lot of time, obviously, with customers and listening to what their, what their challenges are and, and, and figuring out ways we can help them, help them get more secure. Anything stand out? Uh, Particular? Uh, any it, any it, tech that nothing yet. caught your eye? <laughs> nothing yet. <laughs> Other no? than the Delinea platform. That really stood out. There you go. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's funny to see how much AI is out there. I mean, every yeah. every RSA has a theme, and so obviously AI is the, the big theme, and yeah. you're, you're not a company if you don't talk about it right now, but we'll, we'll see how much uh, how much money it makes customers over time, so. Yeah, I mean, we did a survey uh, with our partner ETR prior to RSA. About half the respondents were attending. And of course the number one thing they wanted to see was what's happening with AI you know, and security. Yeah. So huge, huge opportunity yeah. for like really like driving automation, real huge opportunity for cost savings, I think, yeah. for customers, but also a huge opportunity for the adversary to automate their side of the house too, so it, it increases risk and so I think it's going to be uh, you know, still a, a war of attrition. So. Well but last year there was certainly AI talk, mm -hmm. but it was more, okay, you know, the adversaries, you know, better phishing and we think you know, AI has potential. Now there's a lot of talk about securing the AI and AI you know, doing things that are, yeah. aren't intended and needs to, to approach security differently. So yeah. that's, that that's, is new here. It's healthy actually. It's I healthy. think one of the yeah. things that I believe is true and has been true over the last you know, sort of flow of all these big platform shifts, like AI is the first uh, platform shift that I've seen where security is starting to be thought of before it gets deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like cloud was adopted super fast. These, these like technology sort of trends, big trends that change the world, they get adopted and then they're like, oh, I forgot about security. That I think is happening a little differently here. Yes, the models get, have to get invented, but before people are using it now, they're really thinking about security, which is great for us. Yep. Uh, so. It's very true. You know, internet, mobile right. apps, Big data, yep. it was wow. all this kind of cloud, it was all this shadow yep. you know, activities. And yeah. you know, there's definitely shadow AI, but, but people are watching now saying, whoa, hold on. Yeah. You know, and you hear these stories. And, Companies and are getting really smart about much it, aware and, of it. And they should, because it's super powerful, but all could, could be pretty dangerous. Yeah, definitely. Guys, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. Really it's appreciate really, uh, your time. It's really been great. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Thank okay, you. keep it right there. We'll be back wall to wall coverage. We're in deep into day two, theCUBE at RSAC 2024. We'll be right back. <laughs>